This is Dr. Hönig. We will talk about the types of diabetes in this lecture. So um, diabetes is associated with insulin deficiency. We can either have an absolute insulin deficiency uh, where we cannot show that insulin is still uh, uh, being released from beta cells. Usually that's associated with a complete lack of beta cells. Or we can have a relative insulin deficiency where we have fewer beta cells, so we have a decrease in the beta cell mass, uh, and we have abnormal secretion. And uh, this goes along with decreased responsiveness of tissues to insulin, which we call insulin resistance. In type 1 diabetes mellitus, uh, we have an absolute deficiency of insulin. This type, many years ago, was called juvenile onset diabetes because in people it primarily occurs in children or young people. Um, so again, we have an absolute deficiency of insulin with this type of diabetes. Usually, that absolute deficiency of insulin is caused by an autoimmune destruction of beta cells. Sometimes we don't really know what the cause is, and we call that idiopathic. But anyway, um, these patients that have type 1 diabetes, they need insulin therapy for survival. So they are insulin-dependent diabetics. We see this type of diabetes uh, in dogs. Um, and so uh, in dogs, we always need insulin for the treatment of the diabetic state. So if we uh, stimulate uh, insulin secretion by giving high glucose in a type 1 diabetic, basically um, there would be no release. We would see a, a, a biphasic normal release in a healthy person, but not in the type 1 diabetic. A type 1 is not able to release insulin anymore from beta cells because usually there is a destruction of most of the beta cells, sometimes we cannot find any beta cells at all anymore in um, this form of diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is different. This is the type of diabetes um, which in people is mostly associated with obesity. So here we have usually, at least in the beginning, a relative deficiency of insulin. Um, this can progress uh, later to also an absolute deficiency of insulin. And actually, in cats, what we usually see initially is already that their insulin is low. But one of the hallmarks of type 2 diabetes mellitus is that there is insulin resistance, and this is, uh, again, primarily caused by obesity. Uh, the tissues do not respond to insulin appropriately. We have increased endogenous glucose output by the liver. We have decreased glucose uptake by tissues that leads to an increase in blood glucose. And um, that is uh, made worse by a defect in insulin secretion. A form um, of, um, that which is similar to type 2 diabetes occurs in cats. And um, type 2 diabetes is now the most common form of diabetes in people. Uh, it was previously called maturity onset diabetes. That is no longer true because we have so many uh, obese uh, children and adolescents. So um, again, this now uh, no longer uh, only occurs in older people. This can be seen in young people. And we do see a similar form in the cat. So with insulin deficiency now in general, and insulin deficiency goes along with glucagon excess. We have decreased glucose uptake into tissues. We have increased protein catabolism, and we have increased lipolysis. So we are in a catabolic state. So the result is that we have hyperglycemia, there is a threshold for the excretion of glucose in the kidney. When the glucose becomes too high in blood, glucose is spilled into the urine. We see glucosuria, 
and glucose is an osmotic agent, so we see not only a loss of glucose in urine, but we also see a loss of water and electrolytes. Regarding protein catabolism, we have increased plasma amino acids, we have nitrogen loss in urine. Regarding increased lipolysis, we have increased uh, free fatty acids, uh, we have increased ketogenesis, we have ketonuria, we have ketonemia, so we have ketones uh, usually in blood and then uh, because there's also a threshold uh, in the kidney for ketone excretion, when they become too high, we see ketones in urine. So if this continues, then we see dehydration, acidosis, because ketones are acids, uh, and eventually coma and uh, death if untreated. So we already alluded to that. Uh, glucosuria occurs when glucose exceeds the renal tubular transport maximum for glucose. And similarly, ketonuria occurs when ketone bodies exceed the renal tubular transport maximum for ketones. You probably will remember this slide. Um, we do not see ketone bodies when insulin is high and when glucagon is low. Because when insulin is high, then we have glycolysis, we have a uh, well-functioning TCA cycle. Uh, so we have everything um, there in great amounts. We have um, citrate there in great amounts. Uh, you may remember that citrate is the substance that can um, leave the uh, mitochondria, go back out into the cytosol. And in the cytosol, citrate can be made into fatty acids. And the first committed step in that uh, fatty acid biosynthesis is malonyl-CoA. So when times are good, when insulin is high, glucagon is low, we have a lot of citrate, we have a lot of malonyl-CoA. Malonyl-CoA blocks the entry of fatty acids into mitochondria. And so... Uh, Beta oxidation is decreased, and ketone body production, of course, is decreased when we have high insulin and low glucagon. This is different now when we have insulin deficiency. So when we have low insulin and high glucagon, we have um, not much citrate and not much malonyl-CoA. We have a lot of fatty acids because we have lipolysis, we have stimulation of, uh, fatty, of, of triglyceride breakdown um, because our hormone-sensitive lipase is activated. So we have a lot of fatty acids because malonyl-CoA is low. Fatty acids can now go into the mitochondria where they are metabolized in beta-oxidation. But because we also have in a state when insulin is low and glucagon is high, um, we have low oxaloacetate because oxaloacetate is used up in the gluconeogenic pathway. The acetyl-CoA, which is formed from the fatty acid metabolism in the beta-oxidation pathway, does not find a partner to be made into citrate, but uh, now combines with another acetyl-CoA, and this is the beginning of ketone body formation. So with low insulin and high glucagon, we have um, uh, only a small amount of malonyl-CoA. We don't make it as much as we normally would. And so fatty acids can now go into the mitochondria and they can be metabolized in beta oxidation and made into ketone bodies. When we look at diabetics and we look at who is ketotic, who, who has a, a, a large amount of ketones and who doesn't, usually the poorly controlled diabetics have ketone bodies. Um, if we look at an animal which has been well controlled on insulin and now is uh, no longer well controlled, we usually find that uh, either there is some stressful 
situation, so there's an increase in stress hormones for whatever reason, many times we have an infection underlying the large production of ketones in a diabetic that has been previously um, uh, controlled well. So these are the ketone bodies, acetone, acetoacetic acid, and beta-hydroxybutyric acid. Uh, only acetone and acetoacetic acid are beta-keto acids. They only have the um, ketone group. Uh, beta-hydroxybutyric acid is formed um, under um, an excess of hydrogen ions. So the more acidotic the animal is, the more conversion of acetoacetic acid to beta-hydroxybutyric acid occurs. The diabetic condition, the uh, high glucose concentrations, also lead to glycosylation of proteins. So this is a non-enzymatic modification of proteins by glucose. And this leads to a change in protein structure and function. And um, this is why we see, at least in people, um, even very early on in diabetes, we see uh, tissue damage, nephropathy, neuropathy, and so forth. Uh, these um, uh, abnormalities primarily occur because of the combination between glucose and protein. Uh, initially, this is a reversible action, but it becomes irreversible, and then the protein uh, becomes abnormal. So when we look at protein glycosylation, again, we said it's a, a uh, reaction between glucose and protein. And so eventually we end up with this glycosylated protein. So when the blood glucose is high, of course, we have a lot of glycosylated protein. When the blood glucose is low, we have not so much glycosylated protein. We utilize this um, diagnostically. Uh, for instance, in the test called fructosamine. Fructosamine has nothing to do with fructose. Fructosamine looks at the combination between protein, and uh, in the fructosamine test it is primarily albumin, and glucose. Because albumin has a lifespan of about one to two weeks, therefore if fructosamine is high, that tells us that glucose was high in the previous one to two weeks. So fructosamine is an indicator of blood glucose levels during that one to two um, week time period. There is another test which is used in people. We do not have a test for the dog or the cat at this time. Um, in uh, this test called glycosylated hemoglobin, um, we look at a reaction between glucose and hemoglobin. In, uh, with this test, we look actually at the previous two months uh, of glucose control because the half-life of hemoglobin is longer than what we said the half-life of albumin is. So again, we do not currently have this test available to us in um, the dog or the cat. Now, we already talked about the polyol pathway in uh, a diabetic uh, dog. Um, as I said previously, uh, cataract formation, uh, which is a end result of this um, uh, pathway when it's increased um, in the diabetic, um, cataract formation is, is very rare in cats. So diabetic cats usually do not develop cataracts, diabetic dogs um, do develop cataracts. So um, what we uh, see with cataract formation is um, that um, glucose, is, uh, glucose uptake is increased into the lens. Uh, glucose does not need insulin to be taken up into the lens. Uh, inside the lens, in a normal animal, it would be nicely metabolized uh, to sorbitol, and sorbitol would be metabolized 
to fructose and fructose could go into the glycolytic pathway. Because we have so much glucose, the glucose is high in the diabetic, um, we uh, make more, much more sorbitol than we would in a normal animal. And <clears throat> the reaction between sorbitol and fructose, so the metabolism to fructose of sorbitol, is the rate limiting step. And the enzyme cannot quite cope with this excess of sorbitol. And so sorbitol uh, increases in the lens, um, the concentration of sorbitol increases. Sorbitol is an osmotic agent and it will draw water into the lens and this will lead to swelling of the lens fibers which gives us this cloudy. So <clears throat> this is written out here on uh, this slide. Um, so. Uh, what we said is that glucose uptake uh, into uh, the cells of the lens uh, is insulin independent. So with diabetes, we have a lot of glucose uptake. Glucose is metabolized to sorbitol. Sorbitol, because the, um, the uh, metabolism to fructose uh, does not quite keep up. Uh, sorbitol increases then in, in the lens. Uh, and accumulates there, and because it's a um, osmotic agent, it will lead to water retention, and that leads to cell swelling, damage, and then cataract formation. And this next slide here shows you um, what what cataracts look like. You, they really have a very cloudy grayish appearance. And again, this is because we have water retention in the lens and we have cell swelling. So in summary, uh, we have different types of diabetes. The uh, uh, two major forms are type 1 diabetes, which is associated with an absolute deficiency of insulin and generally occurs in dogs. We have type 2 diabetes, which is associated with a relative deficiency of insulin and uh, insulin resistance. Um, a type similar to type 2 uh, occurs in cats. We can say that when we see ketone bodies, they are always a sign of insulin deficiency. And we know that chronic plasma glucose increases lead to increased non-enzymatic glycosylation of proteins such as albumin. We utilize this in the diagnostic test called fructosamine, and we utilize it in the diagnostic test in people called glycosylated hemoglobin. We talked about sorbitol production in the lens um, and uh, an increase in sorbitol being um, uh, the cause for uh, diabetic cataracts. And we said we see glucosuria and ketonuria in uh, diabetics when glucose levels and ketone levels uh, become so high that they exceed the renal threshold and are then excreted into the urine. <clears throat>